Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Graham Shamil, the Executive Director at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Uh, welcome to our first foray to Rockland for one of our series of Café Scientific Lectures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we thought we'd try something rather different this evening, so it's great to see such a big turnout. Um, something different is to have a conversation rather than the standard scientists in front of a PowerPoint presentation uh, droning on for 30 minutes. We thought we could <laughs> interact in a rather more personal way, and I'm uh, delighted to be able to share the stage with Colin Woodard, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, in terms of the way this will play out, we're, we're going to discuss some of the key issues in, in the oceans over the next 30 minutes. And then we're going to invite you at the end uh, to come and stand up and ask us some questions as well. It could be on anything that we've uh, touched on in the previous 30 minutes or any other subject of your choosing. Be good if it is linked to the oceans, both of us. <laughs> Although Colin is probably a lot better than me at uh, going off into politics or other areas than that. But uh, no, seriously, thank you very much for coming this evening and I hope the, the next 30 minutes will be enlightening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Colin. Uh, Colin, as I'm sure many of you know, is from here, whereas I'm from away, <laughs> which will become very apparent as we go on this evening. Uh, he's an investigative journalist and commentator, currently now with the Portland Press Herald and the main Sunday Telegram. Of course, he's well known for his books, uh, Lobster Coast, Ocean's End, which we'll here some parts of this evening, and most recently, uh, American Nations. Uh, as we know, he's a native from Maine, and he's worked in many foreign countries, and I think that gives Colin a, a unique experience uh, in order to share both the uh, stories, the anecdotes, and indeed the actions of people in other parts of the world as they relate to the oceans. Uh, he's a member of the Sea Space Symposium, which is an association of leading ocean and space explorers, scientists, policy makers, and philanthropists. Uh, he holds an MA from the University of Chicago and an MA and BA from Tufts University. Colin. Thank you very much. Well, allow me to introduce uh, Graham Shamil. Uh, Graham received his PhD in marine geochemistry from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland in 1985. We remained on the chemical oceanography faculty until 1996. He then became director of the Scottish Association for Marine Sciences. His particular interest scientifically is in marine geochemistry, which includes identifying the indicators of ocean and climate change and examining human impacts and contamination in coastal and deep seas. His work's taken him to all of the oceans in the world, uh, from atolls in the Pacific impacted by El Nino events to the polar regions and the consequences of melting sea ice, to studies of offshore oil installations and their decommissioning. He's had significant involvement also in marine biotechnology startups on the private sector side. In 2000, he was awarded the title of Honorary Professor at the University of St. Andrews. He is a fellow at the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Institute of Biology. He's been President and Vice President of the new European Federation of Marine Sciences and Technology Societies, and he was Chairman of the European Census for Marine Life Program. He's published over 65 scientific peer-reviewed articles. And he joined the Bigelow Laboratory of Ocean Sciences as Executive Director and President in March 2008. In October 2011, Maine Biz Magazine here in Maine named him to its next list of the 10 people shaping the future of Maine's economy. And may I say also, uh, I've been on, serving on the advisory board of the uh, Bigelow Laboratory for the past couple, three years, and it's a great pleasure to work with him as well. And he's a fantastic communicator uh, of scientific and ocean things to the public. And I'm very pleased to uh, work with him and be with him here tonight. Thanks, Colin. So I, in my introduction for Colin, I alluded to the fact that uh, he'd spent time in many uh, countries around the world, but in particular, his only journalistic career was based in Eastern Europe, particularly Hungary, rather a long way from the oceans, covering some of the strife and troubles that we were having in Europe at that time. So Colin, how did you get interested in the oceans being so far away from the yeah. coast? Yeah, it's rather ironic to grow up in Maine and be around the oceans and the coast all the time, and then um, to actually get involved in ocean reporting and ocean sciences by being in landlocked Hungary. Um, but there's a reason for this. I was uh, in Eastern Europe uh, 
uh, before, during, and for years after the collapse of communism. And one of the um, stories you could not miss was the environmental degradation of the region. There was never any Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act in the Warsaw Pact. And basically all the uh, products of industry um, went into the environment unabated and the results were sometimes quite shocking. And I was covering a lot of those things. They were just front and center. This was not a peripheral issue. And uh, being based in Budapest where the Danube flows through the city underneath all those great bridges and everything in Hungary, by the way, is named after the Danube from you know the hotels to the frequent flyer program on the national airline. <laughs> um, you can't miss the place. But it's also, um, it occurred to us, you know, broad thinking journalists, that the Danube uh, travels for 2,000 miles and drains half of Europe, including, you know, both east and west, and, and is shared with its tributaries, a sort of tree of tributaries, by all these countries in Eastern Europe and the Balkans, which at the time, history was sort of thawing out, and they'd all been historic enemies of one another, and how are they possibly going to coordinate pollution abasement efforts when they all hate each other and can't wait to dump poison and toxin upstream from one another's tributaries and get revenge, you know, whoa, you know. Lead smelter waste for Hungary, there you go. You know. and they could pay them back later in another tributary. So it was a great story of a uh, you know, uh, shared resource and human boundaries and our, the difficulties that the region uh, was going to face. Um, and a lot of us ended up writing about it. And it was a big deal because this, this river system, the whole lower half of it, um, you had a city like Budapest, two and a half million people, and all of the sewage went, well, half of the sewage went into the, uh, into the Danube untreated, aside from just kind of running through um, screens. And all of the sewage of Belgrade, which is two million people, of Bratislava, which is three quarters of a million, of Bucharest, which is two million. In fact, every single city and community on the lower Danube, once you got beyond Vienna, was pretty much dumping all their sewage straight into the river system and keeps being carried downstream. And in addition to the Soviets, um, in Soviet agriculture, you basically, if you were in the Warsaw Pact countries, you got these free imports of highly subsidized um, chemical fertilizers. So you had no incentive not to just dump them uh, in whatever quantities you can because the, the goal was to meet the five-year plan. You know, produce this much wheat, and if you produce more than, than all the better, and if the inputs are free, then you're going to dump tons of inputs. So many that they'll all wash into the river. So the basic point was the river was a complete mess. And we were writing about that, and we thought we had the big enough, you know, lens, the big enough goggles on. But nobody among us all clever people who were writing about this, broadly speaking, were thinking about it widely enough and asking the obvious question, where does the Danube River go? And the answer is the Danube River and this whole load of pollution goes all the way down through Europe and ends up at the Black Sea, which is a semi-enclosed sea the size of California. And that's where all the waste was going. And uh, all of the, you know, the pollution from Chernobyl disaster and all the toxins and things coming out of the lead smelters. But the worst thing of all turned out to be all those nutrients from the sewerage and the fertilizer that were going into the system. And we all got a nasty wake up call when in the early 90s, in the space of two or three years, the Black Sea, which has been providing uh, you know, fish and uh, ecosystem services for, uh, for the uh, Mediterranean cultures the, uh, and all the way forward for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years has been nourishing civilization since ancient Greece, it suddenly suffered a biochemical disaster that almost completely destroyed the ecosystem in the space of two or three years without anybody really realizing ahead of time it was about to happen. So what happened in brief? Well, all of those nutrients were coming into the system. And we, nutrient pollution doesn't sound very scary, right? But the problem is that in the ocean, the ocean like on land, you know, life essentially begins with photosynthesis, except most of the plants are microscopic little algae you can't see that are in the water column. And the, the only thing that's sort of limiting them, they kind of got everything they need, except there's usually shortages in most of the oceans of uh, key um, nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, which happen to be uh, available in huge quantities in both sewer and fertilizer. So just like a lake where you get an algae bloom in a lake, that's what started happening in the Black Sea. There was so many fertilizer, nutrients, and nitrogen and phosphorus available that the algae went crazy. And to make matters worse, Nicolae Ceausescu, the mad di dictator of Romania, had been going around destroying the great natural filter at the end of the Danube. The Danube ends, like many great river systems do, in a great delta country, the Danube Delta. And uh, this acts as a, uh, as a sponge and cleanses out all of the, uh, all the nastiness in the system, including nutrients. But he had gone around deciding that, no, this was a waste of Romania's potential. He was going to grow rice in the fields. So he started clearing them all. And of course, immediately, the salt water intruded and killed all the rice. But no matter, we will build more. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So he was making the matters worse. And this combination of things suddenly caused 
the nutrients to double and quadruple, depending on what uh, you were looking at, and started prompting these enormous mats of algae to start forming. So much algae was blooming that the little tiny zooplankton, little an microscopic animals that go around eating these things couldn't keep up. To make matters worse, they've been overfishing some of the other creatures that might have helped eat some of these things. But long and the short of it is more and more uneaten algae started piling up, and what happens when that occurs in the system is uh, it's left to the bacteria to do it, and when the bacteria in a marine system eat up the algae and decompose them, they need to strip the oxygen out of the water, all the dissolved oxygen. And remember, fish and animals and stuff Right? That's why they have gills, is they actually are breathing, and they need the oxygen down there. So as all that stripping took place, anything that needed oxygen either died or ran away and was displaced. The things that needed to be here to eat suddenly couldn't be there because they couldn't breathe there. Or, or they need to go over here to breathe, sorry, you can't do it. Everything was thrown into disarray. And the algae mats were getting so thick that it was cutting off the light, penetrating to the bottom to the plants, the seaweeds and things that are sort of big plants on the bottom that provide the structure and habitat where everything lives. All of that was dying as well. So you had this great sort of biochemical disaster. And to top it off, and this is a story of multiple human interactions and, and pressures on the ocean that we think of totally separately, right? Agriculture on one side, fisheries at policy on another, land use development on a third. Well, to add in shipping, because uh, in the 80s, just before all this disaster happened, a passing freighter pumped out its bilges. It was coming from North America, apparently, and it pumped out a comb jelly, native to the area around Virginia and Maryland, into the uh, Black Sea, and the Black Sea system being weakened the way it was. This little funny jellyfish-like creature had no natural predators and went completely berserk, running around eating what was left of the little zooplankton that would have eaten the algae down. It went so berserk that it went from maybe one, two, three individual little comb jellies to a billion tons of comb jellies. Now, how big is that? That is 10 times the global typical catch of all the uh, fishing boats in the world, as reported to the UNFAO. A lot of comb jelly. So what I'm telling you is that in a space of just a few years, the Black Sea system was reduced to just jellies and slime, which unfortunately is a trend that a lot of scientists have been seeing all over the world system, although not quite as bad as that particular one. And so one of the things that's always intrigued me, and I wanted to ask you about, Graham, is I mean, all this small stuff at the bottom that we don't, can't even see and aren't usually bothered with, I mean, why, is it, why does it matter and why is it important to yeah. study it or understand it at all? Well, Colin, you've touched on some of the key parts anyway. The, these microorganisms are doing a number of things, sort of services, if you like, for the way in which the planet is operating. So let me just put a, f a little bit of that into context for you. We're pretty familiar with all the larger the charismatic animals, and, and there may be even the plants in the ocean, the whales, the dolphin, and the fish. If we thought about their total mass, that would only be 10% of the biomass in the ocean. That other 90% are these microorganisms. And by my definition, you need a microscope to be able to see them, or my glasses. No, they're very, they are pretty small. And if you go right the way down to the smallest size, just, you know, just a, the, uh, the volume of your fingernail, you're probably going to have over a million viruses and bacteria just in that small droplet of water. So there are literally billions to trillions of these microorganisms doing things. Well, what are they doing? They are improving the quality of the water. Many of them, the microscopic plants, they're photosynthesizing, which essentially means taking up carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. And they do that so efficiently that uh, the audience sitting here, every time you're taking a second breath, you're breathing the oxygen that's been produced by marine phytoplankton. So they are essentially making the planet hospitable. Handy Both to have them around. Very handy to have them around. Of course, if they get out of control, then we have some of the problems like the Black Sea. So that introduces the, the next kind of aspect of microorganisms. How do they regulate themselves? What is the community structure? How does that operate? So places like uh, Bigelow Laboratory essentially draw together all the different types of sciences around the microbial life in the ocean. And the more we look into the microbes, the more we see. So let me explain that a little bit more. Again, on land, and we're a, man obviously is a terrestrial-based organism, so we are very familiar with the world around us from a terrestrial point of view, often forgetting that 70% of the ocean is actually underwater. But that other 30%, we sort of look at 
you know, an oak tree, uh, an insect, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a tortoise. And we will think how different those organisms are. Uh, they sure are in terms of their shape and form, but genetically, they're actually somewhat similar. If we go into the microbial life in the ocean, we will find more genetic diversity in some of those microbes than, than what exists in the terrestrial landmass. We have a very terrestrial-centric view of life. Life in the ocean has evolved in a very different way, and it has evolved because it has managed to an equilibrium of sorts, sustaining food, sustaining biogeochemical cycles, adapting to change. The real challenge is what is going to be happening going forward into the future. So I sort of wanted to ask you about that perspective of change, because I know as you've traveled around the world and met people, you've come into contact with people who've really uh, drawn your awareness to the way things are changing. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, like the oceans and the atmosphere and all of that are changing pretty dramatically. I mean, it's been obvious to me in my travels and both doing marine science work and doing international science reporting is, I mean, climate change is happening. And if you go to the, to the most vulnerable places, it's extremely obvious and human. You don't have to think about it theoretically. When I went down to Antarctica while researching Ocean Zen in the uh, late 90s, and already even then, you know, the, the U.S. research station down on the Antarctic Peninsula, Palmer Station, is located on an island with an enormous uh, glacier behind it. This is sort of sheer wall you can hike up that goes up, you know, I don't know what it must be, like a thousand feet and it's 10,000 years old. Except that uh, if you look at the photographs in the station from 15, 20 years ago, it ends, you know, right outside the outhouse, the back of the station. And now you go out there and there's an entire long field, you know, that it's several, many, many football fields before you reach there because it's scrolling back from the landscape every year faster and faster, even though it's 10,000 years old. You're seeing change at that rate. And indeed, all around the station, you know, the, the, the cold weather loving penguins that the station is there to study are all disappearing from their range because they can't survive. They can't nest properly. They don't have access to the sea ice that they've become used to. Things that, you know, creatures that have been there for thousands and thousands of years suddenly can't tolerate the new climate. Been up to Greenland um, where people actually live and similar things are starting to go on. I was up there just a few years ago and all of the, you know, the Greenlanders you can't, there are no roads in the country between any two cities because the glaciers and the landscape are too absolutely ridiculously hostile to do that or to keep plowed and the population centers wouldn't justify the expense. So in winter, that's when you get around by sled dog and you travel around on the frozen sea ice because the train's inhospitable, but you've got flat land to go to with the sled dogs. Except now the sea ice isn't forming and people are all suddenly isolated all winter, which is normally their traveling season when you go out and see people, and they're starting to get rid of their sled dogs because it's been eight, 10 years since the sea ice was proper to use them. And they're all isolated and totally changing their lives. That's true throughout the whole northern stretch of Greenland. In the far south, they're starting to grow broccoli for the first time since Leif Erikson was there before the, uh, the advent of the, uh, the Little Ice Age. I mean, things that haven't happened in a very long time suddenly are happening very, very quickly, including the cro crops that they can grow. Um, and it, it, you not only see that, but you're starting to see, like you say, in the biochemistry, that, which really struck me, um, it, it, there's, as the oceans warm up, you know, I like to scuba dive, seeing the uh, effect that that's starting to have on coral reefs in terms of bleaching and such. And I remember being down in uh, Grenada at a, uh, at a meeting and uh, going diving with a Perfect, I was assigned a perfect stranger as a, a dive buddy, and we were talking about the, you know, how the reefs had been declining compared to what we'd seen in areas that were more pristine. And, um, and I started mentioning this problem where, of ocean acidification, where because of all the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a lot of that, fortunately for us, on one level, is being absorbed by the oceans. But so much CO2 has been absorbed, it's actually changing the pH value of the oceans making them um, more towards the acid side of the spectrum than they used to be. And it turns out that one of the effects of that is it makes harder for things that grow shells and calcium bodies around themselves, including corals, to, um, to, to grab those free um, you know, calcium and calcinate um, minerals so they can do that. They become less, much less capable and they become weaker and weaker. And uh, I was mentioning this and the guy got a strange look on his face and it turned out as he said, well, yes, you know, I was sealed 15 years ago in that Biosphere 2. He was one of the, the, the Biospherans. 
who was uh, in Arizona, you know, where they're going to seal themselves off into a self-contained environment, and it failed because all the breath from their CO2, they were starting to have uh, CO2 poisoning, and they had to eventually let them out after, I can't remember, a year or something mm -hmm. like that. But one of the clues, while the CO2 was building up, they had a whole tank that he was responsible for as the marine scientist guy with all these corals and stuff in it that was supposed to provide the oxygen for the system. One of the problems was as the CO2 levels went up, he started watching the corals start dissolving. So that, I got that question is, you know, are we headed in towards a world where the corals start dissolving? And, yeah. you know, what, what do these kind of changes that we, you know, see out there anecdotally, what, what do they mean for the, uh, for the oceans? Well, I think ocean acidification has been one of the things that the scientific community has really understood to be a bit of a wake-up call. I think, Colin, we know that in the, um, in the last 100, 150 years of industrialization, we've essentially doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We do that because we're going, we're, we have a, a hydrocarbon and coal-based economy. We're burning the fossil fuels, which we need for, for energy and, and transport, and of course the products of that combustion end up in the atmosphere. Uh, CO2 has never been higher in the atmosphere today than compared to, uh, to over uh, 10 million years since it was as high as it is today, million. yes. Wow. It has been through cycles, up and down, and those are natural cycles, long before man's influence. But nevertheless, it is now climbing and climbing very rapidly in comparison to certainly the last a series of ice ages. If it wasn't for those phytoplankton that we were talking about earlier, the CO2 input into the ocean, uh, the, the CO2 level in the atmosphere would have been maybe two and a half times what it is. And so the oceans are actually, as you say, acting as a sponge. They're a sink. So they've been helping us as we have been using up the fossil fuel reserves. The problem is that we seem to be reaching a point where that absorption process is starting to slow down. And the question is, why is that happening and what are the impacts likely to be? So just a little bit of geochemistry here, because CO2 absorption into water is kind of a strange process. Normally, we think of things as dissolving in water. They dissolve more easily when the water is warmer. Actually, CO2 dissolves in water that's cooler more easily. So that means that the polar regions are where we get more of the CO2 going mm. into the water first. Why does that matter? Well, the polar regions are also the regions particularly in the, in the North Atlantic areas, where we form the new water that circulates around the ocean. That's where w water sinks at the beginning and then travels through a long conveyor belt through the world's oceans. So, yes, it is stopping the atmosphere from getting too quickly too high in CO2, but at the other hand, it's now becoming quite pervasive through the oceans, starting in the areas where new ocean water so is being actually being pumped there. around. So it's being pumped around. Second thing is that, the, um, as Colin said, the carbon dioxide is making the water more acid. Indeed, if you have a, a bottle of water in a, in a little pH meter and just blow into it, you can actually make water acid just from the, the CO2 that you're exhaling. So the same thing is happening in the ocean. And, and right now it's dropped by about 0.1 of a pH unit. Uh, it is expected uh, maybe by uh, as early as 2,100, 2,150 to go to about half a pH unit. Doesn't sound too much, but a pH unit is what we call a logarithmic scale. So that's one unit is a power of 10 change. So these are five-fold, eight-fold, 10-fold uh, changes in the acidity of the ocean. Now, as Colin said, the corals are one type of organism that have these calcium carbonate, these chalk skeletons. But they're not the only things in the ocean. The very same microplankton that are for doing the photosynthesis and helping to reduce the CO2 and put the oxygen back in the atmosphere, uh, per chance, make their skeletons out of chalk. <coughs> so these, these things that are helping us as part of the ecology of the planet are also the ones that are going to be susceptible to some of the change that is going on. So they're skeletons of chalk we starting to recognize, uh, are starting to show the early signs of ocean acidification. And they are, they are part of this primary uh, biological engine that is keeping the system in balance. 
There are different types of this chalk. That starts getting a little complicated. There, are, there is calcite, and there's another mineral phase called aragonite. So even the types of chalk vary between the organisms and the way they might respond to acidity. And finally, there's the, we've talked about the plankton, and we've talked about the corals, but there's also the shellfish, the bivalves and the mollusks. Uh, lobster. Which, and, and lobster shells. So, so there are a lot of other organisms there using the types of calcium carbonate to form their skeletons and form their protective uh, outer shells. And of course, they're living also in conditions that may be susceptible to acidification. So it's a complex interplay. And part of the challenge of science is trying to understand how complex interactions start to come about. And that has been one of the great challenges of applying theoretical science from the laboratory or doing field-based experiments to something that you can usefully use right. to predict. It's one thing me sitting here and saying, Colin, I can tell you exactly how the acidity of ocean is going to change. And you're going to say, yeah, but what do we do right. about it? How do we go about solving this? So I, I know you've got some thoughts on how this sort of ecology of the ocean might, might actually be predicted going forward into the future may be useful for managing. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no idea what we're going to do about the acidification problem. That seems like one that, um, that uh, would keep one awake at night. But in terms of the ecosystem side of things, my impression in reporting on, these, on all these places and, and watching these changes in marine systems around the world is the bottom line seems to be that we need to, as a species, start um, understanding and tailoring our interactions with the oceans uh, so that we concentrate on making sure that we're keeping the ecosystems healthy. Because, I mean, even just from crude self-interest, if we want the maximum number of, you know, X fish or whatever resource we're looking at from the oceans, we want them to be humming along at the best possible optimal pace so that the uh, share of what you can take without damaging them is as large as possible, right? But to do that, you have to start understanding how some of the parts work. And unfortunately, a lot of, uh, of fisheries and a lot of ocean systems have been laid low enough that we actually really do need to sort of get a grasp on how they function, what parts are important to them. We can no longer sort of go and say, you know, uh, we're going to do some calculus of the population model of the cod in this box on the map and predict, according to the computer models, that you can take 18,000 tons of that and then have a totally separate guy, bunch of guys in another room looking at the, uh, the capelin or the, or the fish that the cod eat and completely separate from that. And that other is saying, well, there's a, we have a surplus of these capelin. Let's let the Soviets come in and uh, take all of it because we're, we're, we're not using it, you know. Well, the cod from the guys next door actually are. You're, you're starving your cod next door. And this is exactly what happened in Newfoundland. When the, uh, one of the reasons the cod stocks got in trouble is the other branch of fisheries started having the Soviets come in with factory freezer trawlers and scoop up all these unused capelin that the cod were eating. Those kind of things, the interactions with habitat and you know, where do these things live. And if you go along uh, and, and damage this particular environment or fish them all while they're spawning, you can end up damaging the future of the resource. So yeah, I think that's what we need to do, is we need to understand the systems well enough so we can interact with them and get the most stuff we can from them without hurting them. Because we'll need it, right? We're about to hit a world of 3 billion when I was born not that long ago, and we're going to hit, we're, what, 7 now, and we're going to hit 9 or 10 by 2050. We're going to need all this stuff. So the question and the problem is, uh, uh, how do we gather the information with these incredibly complicated systems to have any hope of doing that sort of thing? And I mean, how do we do it, say, in the Gulf of Maine, close to home? Well, you know, the, 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 ideally, it, from a scientific point of view, we'd be wanting to make the measurements of the entire environment and all the organisms living there continuously, night and day, week after week, year after year, and, and building complex interactive models that would help us to predict that. And clearly, that is, is, would be a massive use of uh, resources and a huge challenge to try and do that. But scientists are making progress at thinking about novel ways of uh, collecting data, and to do that in a routine way that builds up a picture of the ecosystem and the environment in which the organisms are, that are living. Um, a, a short plug for one of my colleagues at, uh, at Bigelow, Barney Balch, who's had a paper just recently published about the Gulf of Maine, 
essentially 15 years of the work of himself and his team using ships of opportunities, the ferries that were crossing across to Nova Scotia, and more recently even using autonomous or robot uh, underwater vehicle to collect data routinely going between Maine and Nova Scotia. Now, when you do that, you know, every season, year after year, you start to get a sense of how at least the, uh, the physics and the chemistry of, of the Gulf of Maine waters are changing. Because you're getting a cross-section. You're getting whole... a cross-section. Right. You're kind of looking down in the water column a few hundred meters, and you're looking east to west as you travel across the, the Gulf. And, of course, you can bring in other information as well, such as how wet it's been, the, the rivers, of, of Maine and the uh, other rivers discharging into the Gulf, they've been undergoing change over this time period. And the ocean currents that have been traveling south from Nova Scotia from further north of Labrador, they've also been changing. So when you start to collect information in this way, and the scientists call it time series, that's the name we give to it, but it gives us a perspective in the time domain as well as the spatial domain, which is where the, the old fisheries data used to be collected. And uh, Barney and his group have actually seen that the Gulf has gone through some pretty dramatic changes. And particularly, five to six years ago, the primary production, that is essentially the phytoplankton, the organisms we were talking about earlier, they've declined quite sharply. Now, the question, of course, is, is why? why has that happened? <laughs> it's kind of like the reverse effect from the Black Sea one that you were talking about earlier. And they hypothesize that it is actually due to the wetter climate that is uh, more river discharge and that fresher water in the Gulf of Maine is pushing the more salty but nutrient-rich water that was flowing south and not allowing it to come into the Gulf and replenish and replenish the nutrients for the phytoplankton stock. Of course, so the issue is going to be you know, things need to eat that phytoplankton further on and to build up part of the food chain. And does this mean the productivity of the Gulf will decrease now uh, in, the, in the next few years to come. And I think the challenge with science, science is that we're looking at little snapshots of time. It takes us a great deal of effort and energy to do that, and we can start to hypothesize about what the future will be. But I think historical records, and I know you've looked into this, they give us another sense of how things have changed. Maybe you would like to t tell us a little you know, bit about that. Well, yeah, one of my, if you're taking snapshots in time now, one of my concerns, I guess one of the things that's happening in science is how do you know what's normal or what right. should we consider to be normal and healthy? I mean, a lot of uh, research is now the shifting baselines uh, phenomenon where, you know, people don't live all that long, and so you, you start losing track of what used to be normal. You can go back into the 1840s and 1850s, and you get all these um, um, fishermen, hook and line fishermen, writing into the Fisheries Commission complaining that these early uh, trawlers with steam-powered trawlers are completely destroying the ecosystem and that there's now, you know, all the fish are smaller and much scarcer than they used to be when they were kids. And you can keep reading similar letters all the way through the 19th century and into the 20th century when you kind of go back and wonder, what are those guys in the 1840s? What did they think was out there? But right. well, we're starting to be able to actually find out because um, you're, you're probably familiar with the work done down at UNH with the historical mapping, basically mm -hmm. sort of forensic fisheries um, ecology where they're trying to recreate what did the fish stocks look like back before we really had proper records in the 19th century? And fortunately, uh, some researchers were able to find in the Blue Hill Customs District two sets of data that let them accurately figure out how many fish were being caught and how big they were um, from the customs data. And this was customs data for the Blue Hill Customs District, which at the time was basically just that one peninsula between Castine and Brooklyn, you know, that, you know, just shy of Ellsworth and on the other side of the bay, just that one peninsula. Um, and all the fish that were being caught, they were being caught by uh, guys in the, you know, I think this was 1862, 1863, in open sailing vessels using hand lines, which they then had to pull up with a cod at the end of them. And when they ran the data, they had to run it several times because it was such a large figure that these guys using this primitive technology within sight of land in this one district were catching more cod than all of the fishermen in the entire Gulf of Maine with the trawlers and depth sounders and everything else and, and, and nets and all gear types put together are catching in a year now. I mean, one customs district. 
And as the scientist said, when you do the math then and you work back and think, what were they eating? You know, what kind of fish stocks were available then? What does that mean for the, what the productivity of the system, what it would have looked like even then? And this, again, is at a time when a generation or two of fishermen had already been complaining that they have destroyed the fish stocks. Um, you know, what, what do you do with those kind of um, moving time signatures when you're studying science and you know, detecting what's normal? Yeah. So that, 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 that introduces a huge challenge about our perspective of the baseline. What is normal and more importantly, how are we going to manage forward going into the future? I, I think that as a scientist, I think there is a cause for optimism about the way that we are approaching this in a more holistic way. I use that word to introduce the concept of the hard science, the social sciences, the uh, climatology, blending that together to better, better understanding of some of the changes that are going on. We also know that the oceans are more bountiful than just the fish stocks. There are other things that the oceans offer. Clearly, they offer beauty, uh, they offer uh, a refreshment of the, of the soul, if you like, and people have sought the oceans uh, f for generations as a place in which to find the, the meanings of life. But they also offer new opportunities, in particular some of the, um, the microbial organisms, the new products from the sea. These might be uh, biochemical uh, products that may be used in human health care or animal nutrition. There are energy sources where we can actually use a better understanding of these microorganisms to properly generate the raw materials that could be a future energy source. Well, so you, could, you could grow algal uh, fuels? Well, essentially. I mean, with the, when, when we're drilling a, 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 an oil well, we're essentially taking the geologic product of algae that have decomposed over many millions of years to produce the hydrocarbon and the gas that we then uh, use uh, for, as an energy resource. What if we could shortcut that in a, in a certain way, in a controlled fashion, use the waste nutrients that were going down the Danube into the Black Sea, could do that in a controlled fashion, find the right kind of algae that would be producing the lipids and the, and the long chain mm -hmm. uh, uh, compounds that then could be transformed into biofuels. And to do that in a recirculating uh, energy neutral environment to create the raw materials for additional energy sources that we're going to need. Aren't you doing that forward. right at Bigelow, that kind of research Well, we're, we're towards trying that? to. We're, we're certainly trying to understand the molecular machinery in these algal cells that gives them a propensity for producing these kinds of uh, um, chemical compounds and uh, energy materials. And I should say that that's happening in other parts of the world as well. But I think that's how science works. We build on the, uh, on the work of others, and we try to do that in a responsible fashion. I think we also want to advocate for the health of the oceans going forward. If we can find ways to diagnose the state of an ocean before it's the crash of the fish stock or before the pollution is clearly impacting on the, the human populations that are living along its coast, or before the ecosystem starts to degrade and collapse, wouldn't that be a powerful technique? And of course, the microbes, they're multiplying very fast. So essentially, we don't have to wait right. for whole generations of fish stocks. What if we can see this within the fast generation turnover of the microbes? Faster than gerbils. Faster than gerbils. <laughs> then we might have a way of helping to diagnose some of these problems right. that we've seen so far over the last few decades and not repeat them again. Sure. So I, I have a, a cause for some optimism about the value of science. It certainly is going to require a lot of diligence going forward, and it, it, and it is somewhat distressing about the way in which science and politics and energy and food all intermingle together. But I think you know, one of the opportunities to have discussions like this is to see where those interactions are and how they might play out in the future in a more meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So I think, Colin, we might ask the audience if they've got any topics or questions uh, that they'd like to raise with us now. Yeah, don't be shy. Yeah, so, uh, so there's a microphone, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> just uh, in the middle of the, each aisle at the front. Don't be shy. This is partly so the people at the back can hear, and also we can uh, uh, hear, hear what you have to say. Fortunately, so. you're right next to it. So. <laughs> 
Could you talk a little bit about the, what you've learned or what we've learned about the ecology in the Gulf of, Me of Mexico following the BP oil spill and the role of microorganisms since it seems to have come off a little better than some of the cataclysmic uh, predictions. And by the way, what we might learn from that relative to the impact of oil drilling in the Arctic, which now seems to be a done mm. deal. A number of things in, in there. <laughs> I, I, first off, I think you're right at one level to say that the Im immediate visible impact on the ecology of the Gulf of Mexico has been less than maybe some of the uh, doom stories might have suggested when it happened. But I think that hides a range of other issues that we're now just starting to identify as the scientific programs build up. The scientists were quick to be there along with the uh, environmental protection agencies in collecting uh, data as the spill was happening and trying to understand the nature of the plume and where it was going and working with the existing models about how much of that oil would travel into the mangroves and the associated coastal ecosystems. What we did not have was a thorough understanding of what was going to happen in the deeper water. This was the first time a major spill was happening subsurface. It was the first time that chemical dispersants in the quantities uh, that were used in the Gulf of Mexico ha had been used. And right now, the drive is to have properly designed scientific programs that will run over a number of years to target some of those uh, processes and outcomes from the spill. Certainly, we know that the microbial population that was inherent in the Gulf is probably playing a key role. What we don't understand is the way that, say, lower oxygen levels in the Gulf of Mexico, which were there before the spill, might be affecting the way in which these microbes help to uh, decompose the, the oil that was in the water column or on the sediment floor. Uh, and at what rate that is going to happen. So there's a complex interplay that is going on. When we get to the Arctic, then, of course, things are dramatically different, not least of which just because of temperature, seasonality, and change in light. One of the things that many people don't remember is that for four months of the year in, in darkness, things like photo degradation of oil, which is often a way in which oil slicks actually break up, that's not going to happen. The colder temperatures prevent the microbes from perhaps working in the same way as they did in the semi-tropical conditions of the Gulf of Mexico. So I would be very cautious to say even what we as scientists and what the environmental uh, engineers working in the Gulf of Mexico learn from that spill, the way in which that is translated to the Arctic would be very different indeed, and I, I would call on much more thorough understanding of the fate of oil spills in, in cold uh, water uh, regions. And remember, in terms of risk mitigation, I mean, the, the BP spill did happen in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the center of you know, the oil industry and oil platforms and oil skimmers and oil response. Right. I mean, you had the entire disaster infrastructure circling it already because that's the center of uh, you know, oil production on the continent, really. And you go up to the Arctic, and that was, a, you know, frozen. We don't have any of that stuff up there yet. So one of the first things, if we're going to go ahead and do that, we have to, as a country, make the investments to actually have the kind of disaster response capability that we have in other oceans that doesn't exist up there, both for saving human lives, but also for responding for these sorts of things to, um, to even to the extent that uh, we were able to with the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon spill. So that's a... Uh, that's a huge infrastructure expense that we and other Arctic nations were going to have to squeeze into our budgets as that moves forward. Thanks, so. yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so you said that as we kind of have this increasing, increasingly wet terrestrial, envir terrestrial environment um, and it's kind of pushing the nutrients out um, in the Gulf of Maine uh, out, and so we're, is it more diluting the nutrients? And if so, as I also heard recently that uh, there's kind of an increase, there's been like a projected increase in like tannins and other things uh, with global warming in uh, a lot of these local uh, terrestrial, I mean, freshwater ecosystems. So if there could possibly be a, cha be a change and maybe uh, increase uh, actually a higher level of nutrients in these areas off the Gulf. 
<laughs> we're into this. It's a good, very good question indeed, because traditional thinking would be that rivers would be carrying more nutrients into the coastal like the waters, like, like the Danube example. I think this comes down to the very uniqueness of both the vegetation in, in Maine and, the, and in the northern hinterlands around the Gulf of Maine, uh, the kind of geology that is there and the rate at which uh, the river discharges have actually been increasing. The seven wettest years in the last century have occurred over the same time frame that we've seen this change in the production. The US Geological Survey, Tom Huntington, who's one of the authors on this paper, is responsible for that, uh, the, the data that, uh, we, that we have for, for the river discharge. So it then becomes a hypothesis of the fact that there is some freshening that we can see in the Gulf, and also the way in which the stratification has changed. The fresher the water, the more it stays on the surface, whereas the salty water is deep down. So it is a three-dimensional picture of what would have been the, uh, the way in which the circulation of nutrients supply from oceanic waters into the Gulf, say, a decade ago, compared to what it is happening now. These are subtle changes, but what we're trying to do is to understand how then that moves up through the, the, the base of the food chain, the primary production, and not just waiting to see the change at the fisheries level or something like it that. Will remain subtle as it works at the top or exponentially expand? Well, that, who, knows? Right. who knows how that, that, how that cascade will work. So, I, I think it is right to question what is the role of the rivers and nutrients, and I think this, is the, this kind of information from time series points us at where we need to target uh, studies going forward in the, into the future. Over on this side. Hi. Um, I wonder what's going on with the Gulf Stream. I remember years ago hearing about the freshwater runoff from Greenland and how yes. that might affect the Gulf Stream, and uh, if any, you have any news about that? Sure. Thank you. Slow down in circulation? <laughs> right. So, so the Gulf Stream is just one part of this ocean conveyor that we mentioned a little bit uh, earlier on. The scientists have great propensity for names. It's called the meridional, <laughs> meridional ocean Even overturning circulation. <laughs> um, and essentially, in the nor North Atlantic region south of Greenland, uh, the water there becomes cold and dense and it sinks, and that starts this, uh, the travel right around uh, the, through the deep oceans of the world so that this surface return is the Gulf Stream, the warm current going back across the surface. And certainly the idea was that the increasing melts from Greenland and the ice caps would actually slow down the sinking of the deep water, and so slow down the deep water circulation, and that would in turn result in a slowdown of the return flow of the Gulf Stream Which at the surface water. might be problematic if you lived in Iceland or Britain. Indeed, because we depend on the Gulf Stream uh, for heating, frankly. We, it would be pretty unpleasant uh, living in that part of Europe without the, Northern the, Labrador or Quebec is exactly, where your latitude is? Precisely. So it is the Gulf Stream that has kept uh, northern West Europe uh, habitable in, in, in many ways. So what are we doing about it? Well, uh, five years ago, a combination of US scientists and European scientists put in an oceanographic array of instruments now stretching all the way from off Florida uh, to North Africa. Uh, we have instrumented the whole deep part of the ocean with current meters and uh, thermometers. We're recording that information, and we're trying to understand whether or not there is a measurable slowdown. This comes back to the whole idea of time series. But it's also what we were saying, that one of the challenges, that will only be five years, ten years of data. How do you put that into the context of something that is clearly much longer? So it's unlikely that we're going to be able to do anything about it, but we're going to build better and more sophisticated models by using real data from the depths of the ocean in order to try and understand whether the hypothesis is there any may preliminary right. conclusion that it doesn't appear or appears uh, there might uh, be something going on? Three years after the first <clears throat> instruments went in, then there was some papers published saying it's slowing down. Two years later, it seemed to have speeded speed up, up a little right. bit again. Right. So that's part we need of more data. data. <laughs> <laughs> Cut back to us in two yeah. millennium or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, we, we've got lots of questions, so... Uh, oh, yeah, we better speed it up. Yep, yeah. so maybe we'll alternate, yes. It, quickly, uh, I noticed that this year we had an earlier uh, molting of lobsters is one of the consequences of warmer ocean temperatures. And I'm sure they're, uh, on top of that meaning that uh, they're doing a lot more filtering of some of those 
microorganisms that are in shorter supply, having decreased fivefold over the last seven years. Um, but they're only one species changing because of the ocean temperature as well as the acidification you're talking about. So it, is there anybody that's looking at the whole ecosystem under multiple factors like this to what's happening not only because of the acidification affecting the, the growth of those, but also uh, what's happening to all the other uh, species in the web that are dependent on them and the rates what, at which the they're consuming the them. Yeah, right. So call, call and whisper to me it. about the, 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 the <laughs> census of marine life, which was uh, one approach to trying to understand how the whole ecology of the ocean was connected together. Uh, but I, I think really the question is also getting at ecosystem-based management. How, how, do, how do we look at the organism of interest, the lobster fishery, but reflect that against all the other changes that seem to be, to be happening? And how do, how do the, right. the scientists and the politicians interact around and that, that's those issues? And that's a multifaceted effort, yeah. yeah. I mean, I went out with one census marine life team that went out to Platts Bank, which is one of the offshore banks off uh, south of Cape Elizabeth. And it was revealing. We, we get out there, and they're, they're trying to study and understand the bank, what turns it on, what turns it off, why suddenly whales come there and start feeding and then suddenly leave again. How do they know what's going on? What is it they're eating? What triggers what they're eating to show up there so that we can understand how is Platts Bank important? You know, would you not, would you want to not fish it during these particular two weeks because you'd get bigger benefits or what's going on? And to do that, the boat's full of people from all different disciplines and all different institutions in, uh, in Maine. You know, people who are looking at really, really small stuff and people are looking at whales and people are looking at seabirds and people are yeah. trying to figure out the little phytoplankton in there. And there was uh, uh, somebody from Bigelow Laboratories Dave, who was looking David at... David Fields was David looking Fields, at, right? the, at the copepods. Looking at little yeah. animals, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's a multifaceted effort. I don't think anybody... I don't think there's any one... Uh, we're scaled up to the point where any one person has that, that, that big picture yet, but we're starting to build the little... And we're trying to build the databases. Once the information may be collected in different laboratories and organizations, it would be great if that information is collected in one place so that, again, it can be mined through uh, for the predictive capacity. And that is starting to happen at long last. That's well. why the pity that things like the Gulf of Maine Ocean Observing System, this GOMUS thing, which is this series of buoys out there that were taking long-term measurements of basic data, sort of like the National Weather Service keeps track of the weather. They were keeping track of the stuff that you could use for these kind of questions or understand how these experiments you were seeing, what the conditions in your part of the Gulf of Maine, how they related to something on the other side of the Gulf. But, you know, most of the funding was just cut and it was, right. I can't remember, it was some shockingly trivial amount of money. Like, you know, you could buy half of an, you know, MB1A Abrams you know, armored personnel carrier or run the system for a decade and, yeah. you know, couldn't come up with the money for that just in the way things work out in Congress. And it's sort of that it doesn't have the priority, the traction, or the con uh, constituency because it sounds boring, data collection buoys, but you know, it's that kind of frustration where we haven't quite prioritized this um, around what I think the, the impacts for society really are. Yeah. Yes, please. On an encouraging note, I've heard that um, there have been major rebounds in um, marine um, ecology in uh, fish sanctuaries, which are areas where, for one reason or another, Fishing doesn't happen. I wonder if you could talk about that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of arguments for um, that there ought to be marine protected areas, either where things are unique and really important during certain periods of time or perhaps all the time, um, or just that there ought to be some that are kind of normal areas of the ocean that you just sort of zone that you're not going to fish them. Why would you do that? Because you want some places to be sort of centers of productivity. You know, the essential idea is that if, uh, if you're causing damage and stuff elsewhere, if you have one area where things are breeding and have the developed habitat over time, you know, basically you let the old growth forest grow up, that you're going to get all kinds of species and birds that maybe you want to hunt and, you know, deer and animals that really like that mature environment, and they'll start wandering out around where you actually do hunt them. And that's the basic idea in terms of advantages to fisheries, and there's pretty good data showing that's exactly what happens in places where it's been tried, and there's basically agreement in the world diplomatic yeah. community that we, yes, indeed, we should have these, and we will have them, and I have signed my name as the prime minister, and I'm sorry we haven't gotten around to it yet. It's sort of the story right now. Everyone agrees, and it's sort of not quite happening, but yeah. Um, we were on the side? Yeah. I wish you were the Prime Minister, Colin. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'd like to point out that the person at this microphone just before me 
was our state yeah. senator, Chris Johnson, yeah. from Lincoln County. And we're very fortunate to have a politician who understands and cares about these issues. And I wanted to address, address that family of issues, which is that uh, there are not that many politicians out there that accept climate change as a reality, although maybe, maybe we're gaining some ground on that. But the, the more worrisome thing is that the connections are not being made between human activity and climate change. And I wonder if you could dialogue a bit about that, because I think that's one of the critical areas that we have. And Colin, you're, now that you're working for the Press Herald, you have a real opportunity to underscore that kind of, those kind of connections. Thank you. I think to me, the, you know, the, the, as, as a science journalist, and you go talk to the scientists and look at the data and stuff, there's broad and almost universal consensus that climate change is happening and it's caused by humans. And scientists, if you cover them at any period of time and go to scientific conferences, they argue and fight like cats and dogs. And any you say, the, you know, the sun rose in the east, and how can you prove that? I have data that says no. I mean, they are not a group that achieves consensus easily. And you know, the culture of science is very much like that. So if you get 99% of all the experts in the world telling you this from all different disciplines, and you go out in the world and you see you know, how fast it's changing at the polls and places like that, I mean, yeah, it's as certain as many of the other things we assume as certainties. And, you know, and, and take public policy action on. The, the chance that they're completely wrong is so small compared to the consequences of not doing anything if they're right, that sort of as a risk analysis, you would definitely go with trying to do something about it. So the frustration is that we don't. And it, yeah, I mean, it's not, and, and the out, uh, what I find outrageous is that it's sort of like a political statement to say that. That's just rational thinking, you know, post enlightenment. And the fact that that's not happening, uh, uh, it, the fact that it's not happening is because there are a lot of interests that have, don't want that to happen and sometimes are intentionally plowing out information that they know to be false. Now, this is not to say that everyone should be skeptical of the data and there should be scientists who say, you know, no, there's something wrong with this and I think that's wrong. Absolutely, and we should pay attention. And, but when the ultimate conclusions are still the overwhelming mass of evidence like that, it, it, it it's too important to societies and people need to just say so. You know, there's a false sense of balance between the deniers and climate science. Oh, well, who's to know? It's because 99% of the people know are on this side and there's one guy over there who has a contract from an oil company. You know, it's that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I think it's frustrating, but that's sort of. I think from the scientific nature. point of view, one of our challenges is that climate change will manifest itself in different ways in different places. That's what the, agnostics or even the criticizers would always point to. And so we have to find a ways of unifying and better understanding that what may be a drought in one place is actually consequential in a flood in another, or the temperature rise and its impact on an ecosystem is going to be as detrimental as cooling in another place. Essentially, it is the rate of change of climate that is the issue. And we can either try to mitigate those, those changes or we can adapt to them. And the problem is that adaptation takes a lot of politics to be able to do that. And I think really what science is trying to do is trying to find how we can all play a part in mitigating the future. That is really where, where the future lies, in my opinion. It's worked to this side, right? Okay. Um, yeah, we're on a trend here because I want to stay with politics as well. Um, <laughs> so my question is, what is the biggest political threat to the ocean, um, the health of the ocean? We're, we're in an election year, and um, you, I'm sure, know far more than I do. Is it, is it climate change? But what is the, you know, what are the few? Is it funding for NSF? In, is the, it, in the U.S. context? In the federal U.S. context, what are the two or three most important risks politically to the health of the ocean so that as we weigh decisions come November, we know what we should be looking towards well, well, as to we me, make I mean, decisions. The biggest problem for the oceans always in federal politics is it, it's out of sight, out of mind, and doesn't have any champions or any traction. Not very many people care about or advocate for them. There's some in fisheries in New England, but you know the, the, there's not some great mass of people saying we need to study the phytoplankton and understand how the ecosystem works. I mean, that's just not on the agenda. There's a lot of problems out there mm. just trying to deal with, you know, financial regulation and, and debt and, and issues of war and peace and national security takes up all of their attention. So trying to get attention for this, this 
somewhat esoteric sounding thing that you can't see and nobody's quite living there and your constituents aren't yelling, that's the central problem, is that it's kind of not on the agenda. Even politicians, you know, generally you talk to elected officials, you know, they might want to move on something, but unless they have followers, you know, in the constituency backing them, they can't, you know, they're, they're, they're not able to move forward like that in political capital. So that's the problem is there, I just think it's not widely understood why it is that all this is important to the rest of us and just from our self-centered human interests to take care of, particularly as I say, as we move towards that world of 2050 with a lot more people. So I think that's the central, central problem. I don't think there's as much resistance, like a lot of these things we talk about in oceans aside from climate change, it's, it's not like there's a big um, uh, constituency against doing the right thing. It's just there's not enough um, you know, concentrated, doesn't have a high enough priority and traction. And it usually involves inter interlocking sectors, and Absolutely. that has been one of the challenges. One, a disappointment, of course, has been the fact that just under two years ago, the president signed the Oceans Act into Congress, and one of the keystones of that would have been marine spatial planning, the idea of thinking about how all the users of the ocean, including amenity value, get together to put a proper planning framework into place. Instead, it's been seen as a, a way in which preventing things from happening into the future. And so it is definitely going on the back burner at the moment, just as uh, Senator Snow was championing an Ocean Endowment Act, using some of the proceeds of, uh, or some of the license fee for offshore drilling to help support both research and conservation in the ocean environment. And that also is, is sliding away for political reasons. So there have been good initiatives, but they, being able to carry those through in a sustained way because it's multi-sectoral is a big challenge, I think. It, it doesn't help that many states and Senate votes are from landlocked places right. that the oceans aren't even part of their framework, which makes it even harder to get your 60 we, votes we, or whatever you need. Are we to the side now? Yes, yeah. please. Um, back in the 70s, uh, when I was uh, in high school, I um, heard about a theory about the Ice Age that uh, stated that uh, uh, it was based on geological evidence that the, uh, during the last Ice Ages that the Arctic uh, Ocean was open. And during the whole Ice Age, uh, it was open. Um, so the theory sort of evolved around the idea that uh, a uh, opening of the Ice Age would uh, uh, allow uh, the water to enter the atmosphere. And if it, if it was true, uh, it, would, it could make an accelerated situation. And they had geological suggestions they found uh, that um, it happened very, very quickly. In a person's lifetime, you could have in the spring, you could have a, a snowfall that would be enough to kick it over so that the radiation would be reflected in the, and if the ocean, and I, I wondered if anyone has looked back at that and, and consider the possibility that the fact that a very warm spell like we're going through actually historically had created a, uh, a radical change reversal into the ice age. I can answer that. <laughs> the, those ideas came about from, uh, as you rightly say, some geologic evidence. And one of the best examples of this is the period from 18,000 years ago as the ice was melting back from the last ice age. We were in the depths of the ice age 18,000 years ago. There was about a kilometer and a half of ice over the top of Rockland 18,000 years ago. Now, as that melted back, uh, clearly, the climate was warming. It wasn't warming quite as fast as it is at this present time, but it was, but it was nevertheless rapid. It happened essentially uh, quite quickly so that the meltwater from those massive ice sheets started to suddenly drain into the North Atlantic. In fact, the St. Lawrence Seaway uh, it was the drainage channel from some massive lakes that were in front of the ice sheets that were receding across the Canadian Shield. That happened so quickly that the ocean circulation, the conveyor belt that I was talking about earlier, essentially shut down for about a 1,000 years. We actually give a name to it. It was called the Younger Dryas Event, and it happened right around the northern European rim. And in the space of a few hundred years, the, uh, the, the climate cooled rapidly by quite a few 
uh, degrees, up to 8 to maybe 10 degrees Celsius over a couple of hundred years. That would be a very dramatic uh, cooling if it happened at the present time. So it came about through a specific set of circumstances uh, geologically associated with the natural rhythm of ice sheets waxing and waning and the geometry of the ocean basins. Would it happen again? Well, it's not going to happen again, given the size of the ice sheets that have <laughs> they've now shrunk to. But it is an indication that the climate system is not a linear system. You often hear the scientists talk about it being non-linear. It is not a, just a constant change backwards and forwards. It goes through rapid episodes as well. But I also believe that human beings are the biggest single agent of forcing the rate of change uh, on the planet at the present time, not the natural system. On this side. Qu question about the nature of science, I suppose. Um, do you think that it's possible that your emphasis as a scientist on the things we disagree on and all the research that's needed and all the uncertainty and all the wonderful things you need to say to be raising money to, to support this endeavor uh, actually undermine, you know, here we are at a point in history where, as a layperson, I feel like we're at a catastrophic point. I mean, things are incredibly dire and serious and, and, and I mean, I, th I think you have to be in denial to think otherwise. Maybe that's just my personal perspective, but I wonder if you do share that perspective, is it possible that, the, do, is there a time for you as a scientist where you feel ethically bound to do something that would, might look like advocacy or at least consolidation of viewpoints? Uh, that is a really interesting question because it is it essentially for me personally that goes to the heart of being a scientist versus my own belief system and at what point do you uh, become an advocate publicly based around the knowledge that you've acquired or you've acquired with your colleagues. I think scientists are recognizing the value of speaking up more clearly as Colin said we, are, we have born, been born, scientists have been born into the idea of peer review. Essentially, it is our colleagues that are the checks and balances on what is uh, right and what is wrong and, and what is properly proven. So the question is, uh, how do we move past the self-checks and balances of the scientific community to emerge into the public arena to talk about these issues and to talk about it with the conviction that we have from scientific grounds. Now, not every, not every scientist is comfortable with doing it, and it's going to happen at, at, in different places in different ways. But I think the time has come, and now I'm speaking personally. We cannot afford over the next decade to simply be the observers. We must now start to also speak for some of the things that are taking place. I mean, there are. <laughs> And there are some parallels in, in the world of American journalism. It's not that you um, become an advocate of something because that's just what you believe in. But at a certain point, if you're covering events and the facts are established, I sort of treat journalism like science. You know, you, you run the, ex here's the research question of the day. You know, it's a really fast question. You know, you're just doing eight hours. But here's the research question. And, uh, and you try to uh, determine what's going on. You collect evidence. You test it and you see what's left, and then you report your findings. And you report, if the findings are clear, that side A is full of it, or side B is full of it, or both sides are, or one side's right or wrong, you state it forthrightly. That's your job, is to inform the public, not to sort of you know, sit around in false um, balances of things when you've established some of the elements of evidence. And I think that that's true of climate change. And unfortunately, in the universe of American journalism, there's always this idea to appear constantly that they've confused objectivity with neutrality, that your job is to remain neutral on every issue. Did the Serbs kill the Bosnians in Sarajevo? Maybe they did, maybe they say they didn't. Who's to say? I mean, <laughs> but you know, if you were there and you watched something happen, then you say, no, they're lying about it because you've established that as a fact. Whatever, you know, that at a certain point, journalism, it's supposed to be objective. You fairly determine what's going on. Tell people only what you can determine definitely is going on. Make sure to ask everybody and give everybody a chance in weighing the evidence. But just like science, at the end, you publish your conclusions. You state exactly what's happening. So I mean, that's um, in the world of climate, unfortunately, that's not always how the media has handled it, which has led to a distortion of public understanding about where the state of the facts and evidence really stand and, and for them to weigh things. So. Um, I think we should be, yeah. yes, I think these will be the last three, okay. three questions, though, for, the, for this Please. night. Thank you. Yeah. With the caveat that a fish stock assessment is sometimes not very accurate, 
Uh, the UN estimates that over 80% of the world's fish stocks are being overfished and on the verge of collapse. But NOAA recently came out with a report that says over 80% of the US fish stocks are in wonderful shape and, and can be exploited uh, pretty much without a problem. It sounds pretty fishy to me. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> my, my understanding and take of it as a journalist, I haven't written an entire story just on that, but in recent years, more or less it's possible for that to be true because the state of fisheries management globally is terrible. But the US, we have, in fact, turned the corner in most places. One of the exceptions is New England, though. If you look at that NOAA data, most of the stocks that haven't recovered are concentrated here. So this is the nub of the problem for domestic fisheries management. But in general terms, if you're assuming you know, that, that the normal system is from 1965 or 1970, not from 1665 or 1670, then yeah, that's probably more or less the case, or that's the trend where we're going. You can be kind of optimistic that US fisheries are doing better, especially outside New England. There are some serious problems, as we all know, here in New England with the way fisheries, in particular many of the ground fish stocks, have been surveyed and managed here. So it's not without its problems. But it is possible for the world to be going to hell in a handbag in fisheries, but the US actually to be doing all right or improving. So. Uh, first, thank you both for coming. This is fascinating. Um, the second part is um, I've shaved off it as a compound question. We'll keep it simple. Um, it's an intersection question, so it touches on human economics, uh, science, atmospheric science, but what I'm really interested in is, is there research or could you comment on the impact of global shipping emissions on the water side of the ship as opposed to the atmospheric side of the ship? Wow. Hmm. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that Okay, so I, I th the, there are many aspects of, of shipping and their impact on the oceans, as a, completely separate from any emissions from the, the smokestack. Uh, one area Colin touched on earlier, which was the transmission of foreign species in the ballast water of ships worldwide. And the International Maritime Organization is certainly concentrated on that issue. Um, the, uh, there is improved planned regulation. We need to have the technologies to uh, identify when ships are clean in inverted commas and to have the right uh, provision at ports and harbors uh, where, where discharges may be taking place. I, I am optimistic that that situation is going to improve. The other area has been around the way in which uh, ships, the, the, the paints and the anti-fouling compounds that have been used on ships, which have been dramatically disastrous for, for shellfish fisheries. Uh, it, and there are many examples um, of impacts of things like tributyl tin, which was used as a common anti-fouling on the, the hulls of, of ships. And I know that, again, uh, there is a considerable work to improve the, the way in which we prevent ships being encrusted with organisms and to do that in the least toxic way possible to uh, animal and plant life. So I don't know if that's specifically what you were talking about in the close vicinity of the water uh, associated with the ship as opposed to the ship emissions. There is, of course, a, a big push for low NOx boilers on ships to limit uh, emissions to make them much more fuel efficient and, and the like from an engineering side. Okay, one more. Um, <laughs> hey, Colin. It's Hello. Roz. I can't see very well. Oh, hi. Hi. Hello, I, we can barely see anybody. Uh, right <laughs> probably lucky for us. Very good. Okay, um, I want to take Colin's step one further where you are locked in land with the river, mm. right? But all I can see is that is there any study where all the fresh water we're digging further and further down to get this fresh water that we're using for fracking and and drinking and using up and then that goes back and, and now the fresh water is melting from the ice into the ocean it seems to be a huge imbalance now happening of what is reserved and landlock water that you can use, and then those salty water you can't use. And is there any way of measuring that at all? It's more of a scientific kind of question. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there's the irony uh, that the uh, freshwater aquifers are being mined while the uh, 
fresh water locked up in the Greenland and elsewhere is melting away into the sea. But right. I mean, it's not directly a marine question, but it is absolutely a problem in terms of the balance sheet of fresh water available for agriculture particularly. So, so I think the, the, it's a very good question about the whole hydrologic cycle, how it's being changed, both as a result of climate change, but also industrial and agricultural processes. And uh, as well as the abstraction from the rivers before they get to the sea, of course, you need to remember that in the coastal zone, just even using the aquifers caused the salt water, the salt wedge, to come inland from the ocean. And so we get salty water moving inland uh, from the coastal zone. And that happens in many low-lying areas of the world. Certainly many people predict that uh, along with food, the water and wa who has water and how it's going to be used is going to be one of the governing agents of change in, in another century or so. Um, I, I think that the, the balance of trying to understand how natural resources confer the stability of nations is going to be one of the themes of the next hundred right. years or so. Wars over water and not oil, like mm. Thomas Friedman says, right, in the yeah. Middle East? So I think with that last question, I'm going to just uh, make uh, just a few announcements just at the end, and then uh, I'd like to be able to thank you as the audience. The first announcement is that uh, the, the Café Scientifique uh, series uh, that Bigelow Laboratory runs will start uh, formally on Tuesday evenings, uh, July 10th, at the Opera House in Booth Bay Harbor. You're most welcome. It's at 6 o'clock in the evening, regularly on Tuesdays. Uh, the second thing is that there is considerable interest in the new facilities that uh, Bigelow Laboratory has been building at East Booth Bay, and we're very happy to open that on three Fridays uh, through the course of the summer from 3 to 4 p.m., uh, June 22nd, July 20th, and August 24th. Those dates will be on the Bigelow website, but that's an open house, essentially, for any members of the public to come and see some of the work that Bigelow is doing. And finally, uh, there's a reception after this, uh, a cash bar, supported by No Technologies, based here in Camden. We thank them for their support this evening. Uh, above all, I'd like to thank you as the audience for, for coming. It's been a tremendous turnout, and I think the quality of the questions and making Colin and I think really quite <laughs> deeply, actually, about the connectivity of the oceans to the whole of mankind has been pretty illuminating. So thank you very much. Thank indeed. you all very much for coming.